Ramadan online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. East London Mosque in London Muslim Centre would love to say thank you to the following businesses and charities for sponsoring our Ramadan Online 2021 programme. Islamic Relief, Muntad Aid, Global Relief Trust, Penny Appeal, Muslim Aid, Human Relief Foundation, Muslim Burial Fund, Irani Taylor Solicitors, City Realtor, AWMA Architecture. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب الشرح لي سازي ويسر لي أمري وحل الأخطة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما ربي يسر ولا تعسر تميم الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all those who have joined us today الحمد لله it's a pleasure to welcome you to another women's hour uh, hosted by the East London Mosque um, and the London Muslim Centre which also includes the Maryam Center, alhamdulillah. Um, so we have been through very difficult times. We continue to do so as uh, there's so much uncertainty as we look forward to uh, what is happening and uh, how we move forward. But alhamdulillah, we've been blessed with Ramadan and we are able to bring to you uh, these programs from the masjid in order to stay connected. So these online Ramadan programs Inshallah is, a, is uh, with the intention that we would like to stay connected but also to, an opportunity for us to bring the masjid to your homes um, and I hope you've been enjoying all the programs that have been brought to you and have been not only enjoying them but also benefiting from them. As part of that uh, all the uh, wonderful range of programs Women's Hour is uh, one, of, one of the programs that we hope that you are benefiting from as well, inshallah. So with me today, I have two wonderful guests to really uh, make the program uh, rich, enjoyable, but also a learning experience, inshallah. And one of the top, the today's topic is, is a really important one uh, as we discuss the, um, the, the host of uh, issues that we've been facing due to COVID um, and particularly around loss and grief. Many of us have loved, lost loved ones uh, neighbors, friends. So we have been um, impacted by by these uh, losses in in many ways. So really, you know, when we think about uh, grief, it is actually a very normal part of life. Uh, but that is changed often by the circumstances that we we are in, and it can take um, a different path if we don't receive the right support or the right, uh, have the right approach in dealing with uh, the loss and grief. So with me today, alhamdulillah, um, I have two wonderful guests uh, to help me unpack uh, this idea of loss and grief within our Muslim community and, and the wider, wider community, uh, inshallah. Um, so before I introduce them, I guess I should introduce myself. So my name is Mahira Ruby. Um, and I am one of the, uh, I'm on the Board of Trustees here at the East London Mosque um, and it gives me real, real great pleasure to host today's programme, Alhamdulillah. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you uh, our guest, uh, Sister Latifa Bassett, who's here uh, live with me in the, in the studio. And um, she is a, a qualified MBACP accredited counsellor and has her own private practice, mashallah and is currently working at Islamic Relief as a, as a manager. Uh, she has previously worked as a lecturer at London Metropolitan University and a former employee, alhamdulillah, of the East London Mosque. Um, and she uh, led the women's development uh, program here and she was coordinating that. She has also worked in the community and youth service and other domestic violence organisations. She is passionate in developing services in the community and has taken part in many other initiatives. Uh, mashallah, we've really benefited as a community from her services. She enjoys supporting the community in the hope to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So welcome to you, Sister Latifa. Welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair for that lovely introduction there. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Well, it's, it's just a fraction of all the things that you do do, mashallah. Okay. Um, moving on to our uh, second guest, Alhamdulillah, we are privileged to have Ustad Amina Blake with us too. Um, she is from uh, Sheffield. Uh, in the UK and uh, mashallah she embraced Islam in 1992. Um, 
Os other uh, Blake's qualifications are, are amazing, which include under, um, graduating in, Islam, in English studies. Uh, she has a postgraduate uh, qualification in teaching, an MSc in leadership and management, and an MA in Islamic studies, mashallah. Um, Ustada Amina has been div uh, active in Dawa. It makes me nervous to introduce such wonderful sisters, so bear with me. Um, active in Dawa since 1994, having studied under various shuyukh onwards, including Dr. Jamal Badawi, uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz Atik from Yemen, and uh, Sheikh Faisal Manju and others, mashallah. Currently, Ustada is an Islamic Studies degree lecturer in Markville Institute of Education, uh, which is in the UK, in Leicester, uh, as well as directing developing the EHUK uh, Women's Refuge Project. Previous roles have included being the Vice President of MAB. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of MAB, it's Muslim Association of Britain, Assistant Secretary General of the MCB, Muslim Council of Britain, and a, a secondary school leadership roles, which included many of those uh, leadership roles, mashallah. Um, Ustada also sits on mosque boards. Uh, she's an Islamic advisor on Halal Guide and writes many articles on Islam, uh, alhamdulillah. So um, Ustada's key role really is uh, a lecturer and she lectures about Islam nationally and internationally and has appeared at conferences and events across the globe. Her topics include the skia, women in the Quran and contemporary society, Dawa, Sira and others. Um, she regularly delivers live interactive lectures and programs for Ikra TV and appears on channels including Sky TV, Islam Channel, BMTV, BBC and others. And we're really privileged to have you with us, uh, Ustada Amina Blake. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Wa Alaikum As Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Welcome to you both. Um, so we, we, without further ado, we will dive into the topic itself. Um, as I've said, you know, a, as an introduction, um, managing loss and grief is really about uh, how we view it first. And uh, if we look at day to day, we are, con we are uh, inadvertently dealing with loss um, on, on an hour to hour, minute to minute, and sometimes day to day, a week to week ba basis. And it's sort of uh, very uh, normal for us to experience loss. And sometimes when we talk about loss and grief, there's an, uh, sort of an impression that it has to be something quite big. It has to be uh, a death or it has to be a loss of a job. But actually it could be uh, just loss in relationships, breaking relationships with, with a friend, a colleague, uh, a family member. It could be that you know, I've, I've misplaced something. So grief can be, uh, in, it can be seen and felt in many different ways. And what I wanted to really do today is to uh, and, uh, with the help of Sister Latif and Ustada Amina is really to explore that a bit more because we have been experiencing uh, a heightened uh, feelings of loss and grief. And, um, and if we think about COVID and, and the situations that we, we have been experiencing, we, it's, it's really, um, you know, the novelty of a virus has, has left us long ago and it's become uh, so difficult, particularly in the last lockdown, where, where before we used to hear of losses on the news, uh, losses of others in other countries, it has actually become family members um, and, and uh, loved ones. And for some it's children, so for some it's their parents, grandparents. So from going from a sort of a, a, a macro, it's become quite macro in terms of how we are how we, uh, feeling the, the feelings of loss and grief. So what I wanted to really start off with was to ask you uh, for yourself first, or so the, uh, Amina, in terms of, uh, from an Islamic perspective, how would you situate this uh, experience of loss and grief? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's, even the word loss, I think, in the English language carries very negative connotations. Um, but actually, when we look at the Quran, the concept of loss is not necessarily portrayed in a negative way. Um, if we think when we learn something, we are searching for two outcomes, really, as human beings. We're searching for a connection with Allah. 
And what that does is that um, fills the gap that has been created by the thing that we have learned. The second thing that we are attempting to gain or regain is the kina. This, uh, this beautiful sense of acceptance within the heart, which leads in turn to uh, a certain type of peacefulness, and a, 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 this really beautiful situation whereby the love is turned into and transformed into a gain. Hmm. Um, I mean, there are many different examples of the Quran, but we have to start with Surah Al Asr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Asr, Inna Al Insan Lafi Husr. So here we have something very interesting about love. And of course, this is talking about time. By time, surely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely, Al Insan, mankind, we, we lose it, we've lost. So this reduces us to a state of zero. We're on ground zero. And when we're on ground zero, the only way we can go is up, right? We can't go back down. Once we're at the bottom, we have to come up. And it's only then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers us this rope of hope. Illa, illa ladina amanu, except those who believe, etc. Do righteous deeds. And so, what this says is yes, we have love, but out of it comes something amazing. We can also focus on um, Surah Al Baqarah, um, uh, verse 216, when we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maybe you dislike something, but it has care. And that is absolutely fundamental to love, to the Islamic attitude towards love. That actually we should flip it over onto its good side and think, okay, I lost such and such maybe five years ago, ten years ago. Everybody, especially the older we get, right? Mm. We have a memory of something or someone, whether it's small or huge, like a family member, that we've lost. As a result of that love, though, we often look back and we see that the hair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has replaced that love with and that has brought from that love is almost like a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis. It's gone from something that feels ugly and really full of loss at the time and something that hurts and really something amazing has uh, come from that. really love the way you, you said that the way, even the way I introduced it in, 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 to a certain degree was very negative and heavy, but actually from a faith perspective, it's the beginning of something, um, a, 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 a path to something greater. And, and as you've given the example of ground zero, the only way is up really uh, from that, mashallah. So uh, just to highlight those two things, so the th things that, two things that we can expect is really a connection uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also uh, something around acceptance. And in between the connection and the acceptance is this idea of hope uh, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gives us hope in uh, moving forward from that ground zero, mashallah. Have I got that kind of right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose to put it in a nutshell, if we have got some a positive mental attitude, and this is so essential, and this is, we look at the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he reacted to very difficult, he did not have an easy life. He had a hard life. He suffered too much love, love that most of us can't even imagine, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, even through his tears, even when he's carrying his small baby to the cover, to the grave, he still has a positive attitude through that pain and through those tears. And he knows that there is hair in all of this. Subhanallah. So actually the way to react to loss lies within ourselves. Very often we look at lots of different other outer aspects for the um, really for the healing.
But the healing really lies within ourselves. We have mm. to really find a way to click that switch, and whether that's through counselling, whether that's through um, coaching, or whether that's through other types of healing, salah, du'a, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using Ramadan, of course, um, as a tool for this. Then we flip it over and actually we view love, not necessarily with less pain, because loss carries pain, that's a part of life. But actually, we, we know that there is Allah's wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al hakim There is wisdom in every type of loss. Uh, which leads me really nicely onto a question that I have for you, uh, Sister Latifa, is that from your practice, from your uh, client base and, and the work you're doing with uh, the cases that you have, yeah. What would you say are the sort of common trends in uh, this this aspect? Have you have you come across a lot of it? Mm. Has it changed due to COVID? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So what what's been the trends in your experience? I mean, in this year it's been quite a difficult year, as we know, because of the pandemic. And like you said, and as Ustada has mentioned as well, people are finding it hard to cope with the loss, and some people have uh, uh, found um, you know the first loss they've had in the family and very difficult and many other losses which they've had as well. Um, so in one family they've lost two or three people in one go so it has been difficult, it's been a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. So people were scared, angry um, and sometimes in denial so they found it very hard to accept what was going on. So at one point there was many losses so it was like the world was in pain yeah. at, at some point. So it's almost as though they lost their livelihood, the loss of loved ones, relationships, and, and just finding it difficult to cope because they had to be indoors. Mm. Um, some people found it very hard to kind of manage day-to-day -day life as well. There's been many loss. Um, some clients, which I, when I go into the case studies later probably, uh, they felt they could not attach to the grief to the shock um, of uh, what's happened because when they had to deal with the f funeral side of it, it's almost they were detached mm -hmm. because they couldn't actually attend the funerals. Some um, clients couldn't attend um, uh, just the general wake where people would come together and they talk about the deceased. Mm -hmm. And doing the normal kind of um, aspects of the funeral process, and uh, the masjid being closed as well, they couldn't attend the janazah. So it has been quite difficult and some people are stuck with grief. So w one particular client, when I spoke to her, she said that they feel that they can't grieve until they have done the whole process in itself. Mm -hmm. So it has been quite a detrimental effect on people. Yeah. Mm. So subhanAllah. I mean, y y you're absolutely right. I think the, the healing process, as Ustada was mentioning, mm -hmm. It hasn't been normal because mm -hmm. uh, that part of the healing process is to be able to wash, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go to the funeral, to be able to be mm -hmm. at the burial site mm -hmm. f for men and uh, and for the families to be able to visit. Mm -hmm. All of that has somehow been taken away with mm -hmm. with, the, with the current situation. So when when you've mentioned that, um, you know, for families they're kind of stuck mm -hmm. uh, in their grief mm -hmm. until. They will, they're able to do that mm -hmm. in between sort of being stuck and waiting for some kind of normality. Yeah. How do you find that they, they manage to cope? What are, the, what, what are they doing to be able to keep okay. going? I think one of the things is trying to create some normality around them, speaking to someone. Mm. And I think um, generally when I speak to clients, they feel um, just to create normality is very difficult when you've suffered such a loss. So just allowing them to speak about what's happening, mm. how they're feeling, um, and just talking about the memories and even, you know, the attachment to the memories as well and what they can do to bring about themselves to create a normal day-to-day -day kind of way of being. So just allowing them to go through the well-being mm. aspects. So things like um, finding kind of a peace, serenity, where they can just sit with the, uh, the loss maybe, um, allowing them to process the grief 
and talk about the feelings they're going through. So sometimes clients will say, I'm angry. Mm -hmm. So a particular client, she suffered a loss where her mum was in a care home and she just suddenly passed away. And there was numerous deaths in the care home as well. She was angry, so, so was so many others. So actually sitting with the anger, what is the anger? And just kind of creating that space for her to talk through the process mm. and attaching it to the grief cycle, maybe. So there are stages of feelings they'll go through. So there'll be kind of um, um, the shock aspect and then going through the kind of protest uh, aspect and then disorganization, kind of reorganization. Mm. So when they when they talk about the feelings and connecting to them they have that kind of realization and acceptance actually it's okay to feel the way i'm feeling mm. it's normal mm. Mm. thank you yeah I, I think that's that's really important to highlight that uh, and also they also mm. mentioned that we need to be able to uh, express mm -hmm. and uh, also i wanted to come to you to ask you so when you were saying that there's there's you know reliance on allah uh, that relationship with allah and then the uh, idea of acceptance. So Sister Latifa just mentioned that often people can feel uh, shock at the first instance, and then uh, to that often quickly moves into anger, a feeling of anger. Um, and when that happens, we'll, you know, generally within the Muslim community, you might find people advising us against this anger. So saying that you know, it shows a sign of ingratitude, it's not being connected to Allah in the right way. Um, you're not relying on Allah. There isn't a tawakkul. You know, so lots of advice on that level to advise us not to be angry at the situation. And often it could be anger at ourselves or anger at the situation. Um, what would you say is a way of dealing with that from a spiritual perspective um, when we feel that anger uh, that what, you know, the, the question may be that why me and that's we know that that's not something that we are encouraged to ask but in reality it might be something that happens because the shock is so big so how do we then move from that anger and how do we manage that anger um bismillah i think the the, the management of anger from a spiritual perspective uh, like sister was saying it's a it's a process that people go through um, and there was an incident actually when the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, went to visit a woman who'd lost her child, she'd lost her baby. And this woman was going through exactly what you're saying. She was shocked, she was angry, she was suffering with the loss. And her, she didn't realise this is the Rasulullah. And actually her reaction to him was negative. She was sort of, you don't know what I'm going through, you don't know how I feel, etc. She was so she was feeling very isolated spiritually. And actually the Rasulullah left her be. And he didn't start scolding her and he wasn't negative towards her. But what he said is actually he speaks about um sabr. And he says true sabr happens at the first shock. However, this is a benchmark we have to remember. Because the, having this acceptance that we're talking about, developing to be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Quran as a sabirin. And Allah says in a few places in the Quran, Allah ma'a sabirin and Allah yasib al sabirin. Allah is with the one who is patient and Allah loves the one who is patient. However, it's a process to get to that stage and in actual fact questioning your own anger and wondering why it is that i feel angry about allah is part of that process of developing the sober so i really disagree when sometimes uh, the shuk and community will turn around and say well you're not allowed to grieve and you're not allowed to it's three days where halas and you're not allowed to um say anything else now, you're not allowed to cry after three days and all the rest of it. Actually, that's entirely incorrect. Because on from an Islamic perspective, as well as from a human and emotional perspective, every single person is dealt with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to their own capability. 
and plodding to their own um, emotional level. And so we can't make a blanket rule that says an acceptance of Qadr is you have to do it, and if you don't do it, then you're essentially not a great Muslim because everyone is on their own spiritual journey. And we have to go back to Surah 216. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it may be that you dislike something, but it has fair, it has good. Allah also says, Allah knows and you do not know. And until we accept the verse, and it's hard to accept, uh, really, it's a difficult thing to accept. Allah ya'lam wa anthum la ta'lamu. Because we're talking about al khayr We're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know, but actually we don't know. And so until we extinguish one small tiny word, which is a massive concept out of our lives, which is if, the word if, if we extinguish that, then we are truly on the level of the Barbarine who are accepting other. But different people, even people who are super, super pious, even, even the members of the Sahaba, عنهم, this word, if, takes time to put into our lives. It can take a day, it can take a week, it can take months, it can take years, it can take a lifetime. Mm. But you will essentially see in the majority of cases that most people, in, especially with a very big disaster hitting them and a big test hitting them, they will get to the point of it at some point. And actually, it could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays them getting to that point because he needs the servant and wants the servant to draw closer to him for our sake. Not for his sake, he doesn't need anything from us. But when we draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closest we draw to Allah is definitely at times of sorrow and the times when we're facing the most hardship, right? Yeah. If we have shukrullah at times of hardship, then really this is the most difficult time to have shukr. But we have to go through this process to get there. And then of course we bring in another word, but in the Mahayusra, in the Yusra, you can't talk about hardship and ease without bringing this particular verse in, can you? And when we look at this linguistically, and sometimes the translations are a little bit out of place, but we see repetition used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With hardship comes ease, ma, with. With the hardship comes ease. The language that Allah subhanahu wa uses there is absolutely amazing. And the word as or the, which is a, a, a singular particle, uh, uh, what happens here is that you remove or you remove, you limit the hardship. You limit the hardship. So one type of hardship, therefore, within this verse leads to multiple places of ease. Mm. You might have one hardship, but the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you multiple types of ease. If we look at the mother of Musa, what happens to her? She has to send, she's inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send her child across the river, right? To who? Like the biggest enemy that they have. That must have been pretty scary. Any of them who've got kids, that just strikes fear into any mother's heart. Imagine setting your child, newborn baby, out on the Nile with all the crocodiles and the, all the... You can't even imagine doing mm. it, but she was inspired by Allah, but she was still human, right? So she has human weaknesses. So when we look at this particular verse, when heart it becomes E, which is repeated, Allah doesn't just say it once, He repeats it. It's emphasized linguistically. If we look at the mother of Musa when she feels weak, she's got this huge problem, she feels weak, her heart, she's just about to speak and, and give the whole game away, which would be disastrous, right? However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does multiple areas of ease for her, the first one, and she must have made du'a at this point, 
The first one is that he lifts her heart. He puts Iman in her heart. Has her situation changed? Has the loss changed? No, not yet. Not yet. Hmm. However, when you look at the different types of ease that happen, we see that eventually the child is brought back to the mother and she's able to raise it. And no doubt she would have had a family to raise in her own child, for Pamela. And this is where the sober comes into this, that we have to approach the problem in that actually Allah has got your back. Allah's got our backs. He's dealing with it. But what we do is we have a particular like formula of a remedy within our mind. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do the timeline that we've set for ourselves, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do it in the way that we decide we want it, then we think that he's left us. We think that there's a big disaster. But actually, in also in Surah al -Bukhara, Allah says, we will indeed test you. So if you're a believer and you're receiving test, this is a good sign. This is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves you. We will indeed test you with hunger, fear, yeah. loss of wealth, life, truth, everything. But for Bashir is Sabarin. And good news to the Sabarin. And this is amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives good news to you. And it's not just those who have achieved this patience and it's easy for them. Actually, my sisters, this is more good news for the people who are struggling to be patient in the most difficult of times. Why? Because when you struggle, you are even closer to Allah than when it's easy. Yeah, and, and, and subhanAllah, it's, it's, it's a testimony of the relationship that we do have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, where, like you said, he has our backs. So a that relationship is quite transparent. And, th and the verse that you related uh, is so powerful because he already warns us. He tells us your life isn't going to be easy. It's going to be, uh, you will be tested. You will be uh, tested with things that you hold dear. Um, and he will test our affairs in, in many uh, ways. Uh, and it might not, it's the same thing could happen to two people, but they process it very differently. And again, that is taken into consideration that each has their own path and will be judged accordingly, uh, depending on uh, when he thinks is the right time to, to be able to make that connection. But it's also something about us uh, putting in the effort, putting in the, uh, the job, like you, you related the story of Musa, mm -hmm. but also the story of Maryam, that when she was in distress, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give her that I will do everything for you, but you still have to do your part of the uh, role. Your, your role is to uh, work hard and, and do what you need to do. But also, you know, she had to shake the tree in order to find sustenance for herself. So the, this idea that um, he has our backs is so powerful because you don't feel alone. Mm. With human relationships, uh, if you put your trust in another human being, you can be disappointed and disappointed time and time again. Whereas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is not the case. That we, we are able to have that reliance, but that's the test really. What sort of um, personality and relationship does it take to, have, to be able to have that reliance mm -hmm. and, and the level of acceptance? So really, when we think about that, um, Sister Latifah, I just wanted to ask you that mm -hmm. when you, when you, um, when you, you know, if you, the viewers that have joined us today mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, thinking about their own journey and, and uh, sort of, yeah, the, their journey in, in this process. And we've mentioned it's not just bereavement, it's also finance, it could be mm. they've had to move. It, there's so many different losses, friendships, community. Yeah. Um, what, how would they identify a, 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 an individual? How would, what can they expect to be signs of grief? So signs some people, grief. when they're in shock, mm. they actually, uh, you know, I remember having colleagues uh, that their parents have passed away and you have time away from work. Mm. But they would return early because they said that mm -hmm. they're coping okay. Mm -hmm. But actually what we noticed was two months down the line, they had a, a breakdown. Mm. So what is it that people can expect? I know you've mentioned the Kubler-Ross sort of mm. uh, uh, cycle of grief, but for, as a universal kind of uh, mm -hmm. advice, 
What can somebody expect to see during times of grief? I think what you can expect probably is an, an individual going through loss is a huge internal kind of way of being. So it's almost as they they have lost something completely. So they they're in shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're talking about the Kubler Ross, I think the reality of the loss takes time to sink in. Right. So the initial reactions are numbness, denial, disbelief. These are the things they're going to be feeling, even down to hysteria, and they can't think straight. So these natural re reactions cushion us against uh, the loss and allow us to feel it more slowly and cope with it better. So that's the kind of first kind of way of um, how, the, how a person will deal with loss. And I think at the next stage is the stage where a person kind of protests that, that the loss cannot be real. It's almost as though they, they feel they can just call the person and they'll just pick up the phone and want to dial the person, but they have that realise um, suddenly that they can't call them, they're yeah. not here no more. So they go through a different kind of emotions like um, the loss cannot be real, strong powerful feelings occur such as anger, guilt, um, fear, yearning and searching for that person they've lost. So while uh, the person struggles be between, like I said earlier, denial and accepting what's happened and the, um, also it, it's a strange kind of space at that time so, so they're in between, like, is it actually happened or is it shock I'm dealing with? So it's a kind of combination. Then I think then they will go for the other stages of disorganisation where when, this, uh, the, when the reality of this only reality of the loss is too real. And that's when everything kind of comes out. This is the time when they feel anxiety, depression. Um, and it's the low point of kind of wheel of grief, if, if you can put it like that. Mm -hmm. And it's characterised by bleakness and despair. And so when someone's going through despair, you can imagine where they are. They're in the low point. And it's almost as though they've given up on themselves. And so it's very difficult at that time. So they have confusion at that time. They will have some form of apathy. You know, how do I deal with this? You know, it's almost as though um, they're trying to connect with what's happened, but it's kind of surreal. Mm. Um, and the, at that time, the feelings may go on forever. That's how they'd be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when they go to the kind of stage where they feel like they can build themselves up again, uh, the person may begin to rebuild their life, acquire, acquire more balance at that time. But when, when someone, like you said, uh, mentioning a colleague, they may take time off. That You only get a couple of weeks off, actually, compassionately leave. So you're at home and trying to manage the funeral, pro funeral processions or wh wh whatever you can do at this time in the pandemic. But also to know when they do come back, they need holding, they need care, they need attention, but not to just check, say to them, are you okay? Because mm -hmm. if you ask them, are you okay? They may break down. Mm -hmm. So giving them that space, would you like anything? Do, you know, can, can I do anything? So holding them in that way, in that kind of regard. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's really interesting because mm. when you think about uh, someone grieving on a personal level, mm. these are kind of s some of the uh, signs that they can see or experience. Mm -hmm. But actually what I've noticed as well that, you know, how families grieve. Mm. So when you think about families, one of the um, sections of the family, I think, that often gets overlooked are the children. Mm. So adults are grieving. Adults are having lots of sharing lots of stories. Adults are, you know, they, they're trying to manage this loss mm -hmm. and, the, and the grief that they're feeling. Um, and within that process, you know, sometimes when I go to visit families that have lost someone or uh, hear of some, you know, mm -hmm. the loss, often what I find is that the kids mm -hmm. are playing or, uh, and we want them to be normal mm -hmm. as, as possible. Mm -hmm. We keep that, that information away. And depending mm -hmm. on the cultural setup, in some cultures, you don't share that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of information as much with the children. They know somebody has passed away or yeah. someone has lost a job or, you know, mm -hmm. a relationship is broken down. But we don't really tell the children. Mm -hmm. So it, because we want to protect them from pain, mm -hmm. we want to protect them from this idea that they, they're alone or mm -hmm. uh, depending on who's passed away. So in terms of family grief, 
what would you say would be a, a good way of um, encouraging families to grieve together if, if that is even a, a way of doing okay. that? I think one of the, I think that's a very important topic actually. We tend to kind of, you know, naturally as families or parents, we want to make sure the children are okay yeah. so we don't share. But it's important part of cycle is just about sitting together and talking to them and actually explaining what's happened. Yeah. You, know, you know, there is a loss in the family and to share that together. But when there are deeper kind of messages when you're talking, that's when you'll say, okay, maybe this mm -hmm. is not the space to talk to them, you know, including them, but a safe space holding mm -hmm. them in that entirety and for them to understand it, because this might be the first experience of death they're actually hearing about. Mm -hmm. So they, they'll be like in awe, you know, what, what does death mean? So are they in heaven? Where are they? So, mm -hmm. so that kind of natural process, you need to kind of check in with the young person and making sure they're okay. And there's another space is how do they, how do you grieve? And people say, uh, how, how can someone grieve? And it's very difficult to talk about maybe, but I think it's very important to share. So things like accepting the loss, so the starting point of the grief is intellectually and emotionally to accept the loss. At, the f at first, the loss is not taken in in that regard. So the grieving individual may keep all the person's belongings and they might be just holding on to them. And naturally, the whole family will notice that, feeling the pain together. So this means allowing an array of emotions to be allowed, talking about them, exploring the good memories. And maybe you might just go into the bad memories, it's okay, but that's natural space you share. Um, the pain of the grief is very real at that time. We try to avoid it, mm -hmm. but what we need to say is okay, it's normal, um, but it's essential part of the process and we need to acknowledge and work through it. So, um, so other people might defend themselves. Um, I can't do this now. I've got to go through the whole funeral process, I need to do this. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a layer of things they have to do. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to say to them, don't keep yourself busy, also acknowledge. But sometimes it's okay to distract yourself from the grief because mm -hmm. just to manage what you need to do for the here and now at this moment, what you, exactly at this time. Talking about it, as we said, it's very important talking it over and over again. Um, that is allowing you to, it to sink in with you um, and not to take the attitude not to talk about it because some people avoid that, like I said. And sometimes sharing with just one individual if you can't share it as a family. So um, that person just needs to sit there and just listen, mm. maybe. So that gives them the space of being heard and not give your kind of thoughts and processes or judgments. Um, taking one day at a time it helps to focus in the here and now, like I said, and not to try to uh, take on everything at once. Grieving takes the time it takes, mm -hmm. and that's the no natural process. Um, you know, there's no fixed time li limits, as we were discussing earlier. I'll get over. Two weeks is not enough for anyone to grieve, having compassion, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, when you have leave from work. But you, it will take you years, maybe. It might take you three months, who mm -hmm. knows, but mm -hmm. it depends on what you're going for, how close you were to that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also expect anniversaries, like, um, you know, you have Eid come, you know, Ramadan, this is the first Ramadan without them. So it's gonna be difficult, um, you know, they're not there and they might be sitting on that particular chair every, you know, when you break fast together mm -hmm. as a family. So it's important to acknowledge that as well. So expect anniversaries uh, to be times when sad feelings to be rekindled and it's okay. And, it, um, and there's a family holding each other in that way. And I think everyone seems to forget this, that you have to be your own best friend because I think you need to look after yourself and, and you need to rest, you need to eat, you need to sleep. You're human. If one of those things, functionalities kind of go away, you will have anxiety and some form of kind of stress mm -hmm. or you may fall in depression mode. Mm. So you need to take that time to retreat and time to talk and try not to be isolated. Mm -hmm. So like closing the door, I don't want to talk. I mm -hmm. can't do that at the moment. Um, so these are very important factors. So you need to 
grieve. There are tasks involved in grieving. Mm. That's a natural process and you have to do that, part of the healing process. Yeah. yeah. I think you've, you've touched on something really important, which is self-compassion. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we see when it comes to mm. uh, grief is that we lose touch mm. with what our needs are. So people yeah. may stop eating. Uh, the self-care really mm. is, is a struggle. Mm. Um, which brings me to a question that I wanted to ask uh, Osada uh, Amina is, you know, when you, when you think about that state, so uh, the, the grieving process where, um, as, as uh, Cecilia Latifa was mentioned, that the self-care is really, really important. And there's, there's individual grief, there's the family grief, but also mm -hmm. how does the community support mm -hmm. somebody or a family going through grief and loss? Um, often we see there's, a, there's cultural practices of, you know, cooking for, cooking for the family, visiting the family. Some people will move in and stay with the family. Um, when do we know, as, as Muslims, as, as people within our community, when do we know what is the right support that we're providing and when is it that we're overwhelming the family? So there's something about having the space to grieve Mm -hmm. and then creating a sense of overwhelm because you don't get that space. Somebody's always there. Uh, lots of people are always there visiting all through the day. So how do we as a community get better at supporting families grieving or individuals grieving? I'm oh, sorry, my loudspeaker has gone off, so I can't hear you very well. Um, ah, did you hear the question? Yeah, so how, okay. can, how can community um you know sort of support the individual it's a, it's a very difficult question because um at the end of the day we have um we live in a plural society and it's very important to remember and to acknowledge that even different generations of the same family may have slightly different ways of dealing with grief um, and different needs of support. So obviously traditionally, you know, as far as the sun is concerned, and also the Arab culture as well, is, you know, you will take food to the family, which is, all, you know, it's fantastic because if you, you know, if you've just lost someone and you're dealing with um, funerals, et cetera, and in some cultures, a lot of visitors as well, then the last thing you want to be dealing with is cooking food and all these sort of um, logistics type things. However, um, I think also we should think about the person's um, or the family's individual needs and um, what they are as a family, rather than having a sort of blanket uh, application. You know, um, I think like, like Sister said earlier, you know, asking that person or that family, what do you need me to do? I know um, I've been approached in the past by families who wanted me to maybe sort out the paperwork um, in the in the past, I've you know gone to the graveyard um, with a mother who lost a child. In the past, I've done various things for various people. Sometimes it might be a language issue, and people just don't understand the paperwork that needs to be done. And when you've just lost someone, and you're faced with all these forms, and sometimes you know uh, that there might be um, an autopsy to deal with, which obviously makes things even more difficult, or it might be. Um, uh, somebody who's been murdered or a sudden death or something like that, then you have to navigate all that stuff at a time of intense grief, possibly in a language that's not your first language. So offering services such as, as that, rather than just the sort of other type of emotional community logistic type services, I think is an, is an absolute godsend for some people. But then for other cultures and other families, um, and we were talking uh, a short while ago about children and, you know, children sort of having death almost hidden from them. That was the case in my culture. Obviously, I'm English. And I remember my grandfather passing away when I was probably about nine or ten. And we got a phone call in the middle of the night. My mum's father had passed away. And there was obviously going to be a funeral and everything. But it was just not spoken about because... In, in English culture, death is a really taboo subject. You won't see many children at funerals, for example, traditionally for that generation. You won't see um, them even at the wake unless it's very, very close relatives like the siblings or the, uh, or the immediate uh, close relatives. But I wasn't, I wasn't taken to the funeral. I didn't go to the funeral. 
So, you know, I think although, yes, we, um, we offer support, I find that sometimes in our community, there is an assumption that somebody who has had a close family member pass away automatically wants lots of visitors, for example. But actually, in some cultures and some individuals, they actually just want private time with their close family and they don't want people, lots of, you know, sort of lots of people um, traipsing through their house. And, you know, obviously then there's the, 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 the pressure to make tea and, and, you know, feed them and all the rest of this stuff. So, again, uh, absolute key is ask them what they want rather than presuming this is what you want so therefore yeah. this is what you're going to get um, because it can actually cause huge unnecessary stress at a time that's already stressful so yeah it's, it's only if we, we can actually take that back to the sunnah and when we look at the actions and the way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa dealt with different people from different other from, from different tribes from different cultures and with different spiritual um capabilities or levels we see that the rasulullah would have very different approaches and different expectations according to what that person's context was so it so for, i suppose with the matter of ibadah um you might have a situation where you know at the time the rasulullah you had a a, uh, a bedouin who comes to him and who is really rough not educated comes from a particular background and speaks to him in a particular way tell me about islam tell me what i what i need to do to you know be a muslim he tells him the basics and says and he says right I'm, that's what i'm going to do i'm going to do anything more than that and the prophet peace be upon him says that's enough for you that's sufficient for you Whereas you think that the, the expectations of the Rasulullah on the Sahaba and on himself would have been that? No, of course not. Because they're at a different level and they have different capabilities and different needs. So it's about approaching it with two elements, I think. Approaching it with hikmah, with wisdom, and with emotional intelligence. And really the, the, um, the benchmark for emotional intelligence is the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because that's something that's absolutely amazing at. Absolutely. And I think it, it is about meeting their needs rather than meeting my needs to want to do something for them. So again, being in yeah. tune with what it is that the family requires and needs in order to uh, manage that situation. And again, uh, uh, we're very short of time. Um, you mentioned earlier about counselling, uh, coaching in order to be able to uh, deal with this situation just in sort of 30 seconds and I'm sorry to give you such a short time in terms of knowing uh, when does somebody know that you know I the balance between tawakkul and seeking support so there is a there is a, a sometimes a misunderstanding when you go to seek support that you don't have tawakkul so Ustad Amina if you can very briefly say uh, share with us what, what your take is on that Sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, my, so when does, when does a person know that they are not compromising on their tawakkul when they reach out for support? So in terms of counselling um, yeah. and uh, coaching, if they require support from a professional, when do they know that this is okay uh, and people don't say to them or they don't have a guilt that am I not being uh, accepting of my situation uh, and am I, shouldn't, shouldn't I really just be relying on Allah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, think, I think one key element that we've not really spoken about, and Mashallah, the sister's given some like, amazing, um, it's very practical steps, and I'm, I'm actually taking those on board myself, Mashallah, so, because I'm one of those people who really, when I get grief, I internalise it, I stick it in a box, I close the lid and I just sort of put mm. it to the side and I'm like, how it's fine, but it's not always fine. And sometimes you do need to take those steps and reach out to people. Um, you know, again, um, it's the, I, I suppose there's two different concepts here from an Islamic perspective, and I'll, I'll just come from that perspective. Um, but when we look at the concept of inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'u, Okay, because so everybody is told when we lose something or even a person or even like the, some money or whatever, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Okay, so, but let's examine that for a second to, and think about what that actually means. Obviously, when we are saying this, we're saying it with 
um, acceptance, and we're saying it with um, with true feelings towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're accepting. But it's also a, a du'a, and it's also a process. So to actually achieve inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un, again, it's a process. Now, there are a couple of different things that people can do, and obviously as well, it depends on their level of iman, it depends on their whether they're practicing or not practicing, but actually, what I find, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will um, uh, agree with me, is that especially when you've lost a loved one, um, it really is the time when you even, I guess even non-Muslims as well, they will turn to their spirituality more at that time than maybe at other times in their life. And so then we can turn to a really nice uh, part of the verse in the Quran, which is in Surah 40. It's, at, it's in, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ad'uni astajib lakum. He says, ask and I will respond to you. So for people like me, and I know many other people out there do this, who almost internalize the, um, the process of grieving and maybe we're too busy. It might be that you're the matriarch or the leader of your family, the head of your family. And so you almost feel like you have to be the, the facilitator and the supporter for everybody else in the family. But then where do you go for your process of grief? Who do you turn to? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask and I will respond to you. Very often when we face this loss, one of our first places of turning, I, I would hope inshallah, and I know this from my own experience and I think from a lot of other people's experiences, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we, we make dua. We make dua and we ask Allah and we say, you know, we think to ourselves, okay, will this get rid of the guilt? No, not necessarily. And that's something we have to accept. Until you've gone through that process, we will continue to feel some amount of guilt. Should I have seen that person more often? Yeah. Uh, should I have called the doctor earlier? Should I have given that medication at that time? Why did I delay it 10 minutes? There's always questions in our mind. But once we've handed over the reins to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we think to ourselves, right, okay, now I still feel terrible. And actually, I'm thinking now that I might need to go and access some extra support. I might need to go and talk to someone. And actually getting the siha which is essentially what counselling or um, coaching or whatever is. And actually, you know, it depends on your type of personality as to whether coaching might be a good uh, grief uh, uh, sort of uh, route to uh, solve your grief or counselling. Or there are many different routes as well, people can say. However, when you're seeking nasiha from somebody, this is a practice of the Sahaba, this is a practice of the Rasulullah Talking about your grief and talking about your feelings is a practice of not just our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but of other Prophets as well. Prophets have complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if you feel guilty, it doesn't mean that you have a no or weak man. We must remember that. You can't beat yourself up spiritually because you're feeling guilty about something. Because, like the sister said, it is definitely part of the process. And what we find at the other end of that is you might have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, please help me. I feel so bad. I feel so guilty. I feel like I've done something wrong. And then Allah maybe will put inspire you in your mind or give you a dream. Or if you're really unsure, pray istikhara. My brothers and sisters, pray istikhara. And turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, is it right for me to do this? Is it right for me to access counseling? Is this the way for me to go? And believe me, if it is, you will be inspired to do this because the very fact that Allah put it in your mind in the first place is surely part of the shifa, the healing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is who? He is a shafi. And this healing comes through different channels. Jazakallah khair. I mean, I think that's wrapped up the uh, discussion really well that we centre ourselves on reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will facilitate Mm -hmm. what is required in order to enable us to go through that healing process, mm -hmm. inshallah. Um, we are out of time, uh, and so mm -hmm. it leads me to say, um, you know, thank you so much, Jazakumullah Khair, to Sister Latifa and to Usada Amina for joining us today. Um, and this is a topic we can talk for years. I mean, it's not even mm -hmm. hours, really. It's, it's something that is 
needs to be spoken of more, I think, because there is a resistance in the community mm -hmm. to talk about grief and loss. But for us, we are, we, that's something we're reminded of every day. The only thing guaranteed in life is death. Um, and so it, we are encouraged to uh, discuss and, um, and, and, and help each other, lift each other in this process. As we started the session with uh, Ustad Amina saying that th this is seen and uh, presented in a negative way, whereas Islam subhanAllah puts a positive light to it because it's, mm. it's, it's the making of someone. Yeah, mm. It's the making of who we are. Um, I just want to conclude by really uh, sharing with our viewers that we do have a counselling service at the Mariam Centre um, for women and it is referral based uh, and the referral form is on the website. If you go to the website, inshallah, and the Mariam Centre uh, services, you will find the referral form there. Uh, we are hoping to uh, start a support group for families who have been through bereavement, who, ha who are struggling with uh, family members still or loved ones um, who have gone through different uh, experiences of bereavement and, and also uh, loss of some kind. So it, it look out for that, inshallah, and uh, we hope that you will benefit from this service immensely, inshallah. So jazakum la khair once again, uh, and I look forward to um, our paths crossing in, in uh, future, inshallah. And uh, thank you uh, to all the viewers for joining. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah kaza bilaik. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan Online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is your brother in Islam, Yasir Qadi. I want to say that uh, the East London Masjid is one of my favorite masjids to visit, to participate in. I'm very honored and humbled to be uh, welcomed over here. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, your community uh, has both quality and quantity. Yani, mashallah, the number of people that are present here for the five daily salawat, for Jumu'ah, for, for, uh, for the Ramadan prayers, it is just amazing, it is stupendous, and it is hardly imaginable that any other Western masjid in the world can be so full. Frankly, many even Eastern masajid in the Muslim world do not have as much vibrancy as your masjid. You also have, mashallah, quality as well, the quality of your local mashayikh, your local scholars, and also the scholars that come uh, visiting over here from overseas. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, you have something that is worthy to be jealous of in a, in a positive manner, and it is okay to be jealous of good. And wallahi, we in the uh, world over in the Western world, we are jealous in a positive manner of your community and the vibrancy and the feelings of brotherhood and sisterhood in this masjid, the knowledge, the scholarship, uh, the pre events, the programs, all of the various niches are catered to, and I have no hesitation in encouraging all of you to donate of your time, your money, your du'as, your efforts to make this masjid even bigger and better and prouder. Allah says in the Quran, "Inna ya'muru masajid Allahi man amna billahi wal yawm al-akhir." The only people who frequent and take care of ya'mur means not only to come to but to take care of. The people who frequent and take care of the masajid are those who believe in Allah azza wa jal and in the hereafter. May Allah make us of those who truly take care of. Of his masajid. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.